In our previous presentation, we talked about uh, the differences uh, at a um, 20,000 foot level between the Florida Evidentiary Code, the Federal Rules of Evidence. We looked at those preliminary rules that deal with uh, things like presumptions, burdens of proof, and we ended with a discussion on relevancy, and we looked at how the Federal Rules of Evidence address character evidence under 404A and 404B. What I want to do now is talk with you about the Florida Evidentiary Code and how the Florida Evidentiary Code specifically addresses character evidence. Now up here on the slide I've got FEC 90.4041 uh, and it's the basic premise just like in the federal rules that character evidence is not admissible to prove conduct from a propensity perspective. So evidence of a person's character or a trait of character is inadmissible to prove action in conformity with it on a particular occasion except and then we get into 4041 and 4042 and 4041 and 4042 allow for the door to character to be opened for character to be made legally relevant by a decision of the accused in the proceeding the accused has the ability to make their character and the character of the victim relevant and the way that they do that is by offering evidence of character, either through direct testimony or cross-examination. Once that happens, um, and I've got an example up here of that, once that happens, then the door has been opened and the other side, normally the prosecution, can rebut. So here we've got someone being prosecuted for murder. The defendant calls two witnesses to the stand and they testify that the defendant has a reputation for being peaceful and nonviolent. Now remember, in the state of Florida, reputation testimony is allowed under 405, opinion testimony is not. And that's why it has to be reputation testimony for this character trait of peacefulness and nonviolence. Well, what does that do? That opens the door for the state. And now the prosecution can present witnesses who can testify that the defendant's reputation is that he is a violent, aggressive person. That's the way uh, the door of character swings in the state of Florida. Now there is a fundamental difference between the Florida Evidentiary Code and the Federal Rules of Evidence. Uh, and it works like this. If I put on evidence of the defendant's character, I have opened the door to rebuttal evidence of the defendant's character. If I put on evidence of the victim's character, I've opened the door to rebuttal evidence of the victim's character. When I put on evidence of the victim's character, I have not opened the door to the defendant's character in the state of Florida. That is different from the way it works in the federal system. In the federal system, if I open the door to the victim's character, I've opened the door to rebuttal evidence on that trait for both the victim and the accused. And that's a fundamental difference between the two codes that you need to be aware of. Uh, here is uh, Federal Florida Evidentiary Code 90.4041 um, that is laid out. Um, to, just to review it, you can put in the evidence of the pertinent character trait of the victim. It can be offered by the accused or by the prosecution to rebut. Or it can be evidence of a character trait for peacefulness of the victim if we're in a prosecution in a homicide case and factual evidence has been presented to suggest that the victim was the aggressor in the case. In that set of circumstances, we can potentially offer character evidence uh, during, uh, without the door having otherwise been opened. Okay, so that's the way it works in general. Let's now take a look at uh, another example. Here we've got the defendant. He claims self-defense in the killing of a victim. Uh, he calls two witnesses who testify that in their opinion the victim was a violent aggressive person. The prosecution can now call witnesses to present evidence that the victim was in fact uh, a peaceful person. I want you to remember in accordance with this slide that Federal Rule of Evidence 404 has a broader application than Florida Evidentiary Code 90.4041. 404A implicates both the victim and the accused character for rebuttal when the victim's character is attacked. As I've stated previously, that does not happen in the state of Florida. Now let's look at 
Florida Evidentiary Code Rule 4042. 4042 is the Florida equivalent of Federal Rule of Evidence 404B. It's the other crimes, wrongs, or acts evidence. And the way that evidence works is we allow for the admissibility of evidence that would otherwise be considered character evidence for a non-character theory of relevancy. In other words, we're going to use this evidence to prove something other than character. And this list here are the most common factors that we use this evidence to prove. Motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, and absence of mistake. And those are ones that are routinely used by the state to offer evidence during their case in chief that would otherwise be considered inadmissible character evidence against the accused. Uh, it's important that the exception used under 4042 in Florida very, very closely uh, mirror or identify the charged offense sufficiently that it's going to overcome a 403 objection. The, the Florida courts are very sensitive to uh, the potential for unfair prejudice in letting this bad character evidence in, and it's really got to hit the exception uh, in a way that makes it uh, clear uh, that it is, in fact, uh, good evidence of motive, plan, opportunity, whichever one it happens to be. The classic example that I would give you is one that's uh, sort of uh, apocryphal or ubiquitous at this point. Uh, all of us remember uh, the movie uh, Home Alone back when McCarthy, McCarthy McCullen used to actually be an actor. Uh, you got this little boy and you got Joe Pesci and the other guy whose name I can never remember uh, who are the, uh, the wet bandits, right? And what do they do? They burglar homes and every time after they steal from the home, they plug up all the sinks and they turn on the water. And the house fills with water. There's a lot of destruction, but there's also, you know, obliteration of evidence, making the wet bandits harder to catch. Well, let's say we've got Joe Pesci from that movie and he's out on probation, having served his time for being one of the wet bandits. And suddenly a series of burglaries begin to happen in, our, in the neighborhood and lo and behold, we arrest and charge Mr. Pesci for those crimes. Should the state be able to offer evidence of his prior bad act, the way in which he committed those other burglaries, to prove that he committed these crimes? Well, they couldn't say, well, because he's been a burglar in the past, he's a burglar this time. That would be a propensity argument, not allowed by 4041. But they could say, look, he has a particular preparation and plan that he implements, and we can identify him based upon the way in which he commits these crimes. They could hold up the similarities of the earlier crimes with the unsolved crimes and get that evidence in for that purpose. Of course, in the state of Florida, there would also be a limiting instruction that would come with that evidence unless weighed by the defense, making certain that the jury understood that they could only use it for a non-propensity theory of relevancy. Um, but do it, they could. Of course, remember, there's a collateral, um, there's a similarity requirement here. Um, particularly when I'm trying to show identity, I've got to show sufficient um, uh, points of similarity between the charged offense and the earlier misconduct um, that are sufficiently unusual, that are sufficiently unique that the court's going to be comfortable that this evidence really is being offered uh, to prove identity and not just to smear the character of the defendant. Uh, Florida courts, uh, both uh, in practice and in the, um, the jurisprudence, the case law, it's, it's very clear that they're quite concerned with this issue, and you need to be concerned with it too. Um, the same thing is true for absence of mistake or abstinence, or absence. The or accident, excuse me, the collateral offense must be strikingly similar, uh, and it must have some unique characteristics. And that's pulled right out of here out of a Florida case from 2002, Robinson v. The State. Uh, the courts are serious about this, and they're serious about it because there is phenomenal prejudicial impact by admitting previous conduct uh, that's similar to the charged offense. And they're really worried about it being unfairly prejudicial, when it's sufficiently similar, uh, it's just become prejudicial 
but not unfairly. And that's what the state wants, that's what the system wants, and that's what the defendant deserves. And the rule is designed to protect that. So remember, in the state of Florida, when I go to prove a character trait under 4041 or 4042, I am limited to reputation testimony um, and occasionally specific instances of conduct on cross-examination. And that's what Rule 90.405 tells us. Let's shift gears now and talk about habit or routine in the state of Florida. There's the Federal Rule of Evidence 406, habit or routine. Um, in Florida, the rule has historically been interpreted to deal with organizations or corporations and, and not individuals. Uh, and if it is the habit of an organization to do something the same way every time, that's going to be admissible, even if um, there's no corroboration for the evidence. But you've got to look for true indications of the habit. It needs to be invariable. It needs to be um, constant. It needs to be done the same way at the same time in the same place. And it's got to be routine. Now, Florida has applied this concept of habit to individuals through case law. Uh, and there's a movement uh, to change Florida Evidentiary Code 406 to include uh, individuals uh, addressed under habit, but it's already come in through case law. So habit is very narrow. Uh, you've really got to hit all the points to make it work, but when you can do it, you're not even concerned with the possibility of uh, requiring corroboration. Uh, it's a little bit like Jafar and the lamp uh, in the Aladdin movies. It has phenomenal cosmic power within its teeny tiny space. Uh, and where new lawyers or young lawyers or, or lawyers who aren't familiar with the evidentiary code most often make a mistake, it is in they try to apply habit uh, in those circumstances where it just doesn't meet the requirements of the rule. Of course, you're not going to do that now, are you? Although the Florida rule does not apply to the routine practice of an individual, a court may still admit the evidence based on the determination of its probative value. Uh, this is sort of the thought process that uh, through case law, we can admit habit evidence for the individual. And you'll notice I've got the side up here for you. It's McKeithen VACA Health Services of Florida. And that's a 2004 case. And since this 2004 case, uh, we're trying to, uh, to get the change in, and I believe it's going to be in soon if it's not in already. Now that we've talked about 406, let's talk instead about subsequent remedial measures. Uh, under Florida Evidentiary Code 90.407, it's also 407 uh, in the Federal Rules of Evidence, and it's identical to the Federal Rule. Uh, the concept behind uh, subsequent remedial measures is that we do not want to uh, penalize an, an individual or entity who takes actions to make the place safer after they've learned of a problem with their property or an issue in their, um, in their store. So for example, let's say we've got uh, someone who slips and falls in the produce section of the grocery store and the reason that they slipped and fell ostensibly is because there was a leak in the little water that comes on to keep the vegetables fresh. And it, was, it poured out all over the floor. And the, the store comes in and they fix that. We will not let the fact that they fixed the, the leak be offered as evidence that they were negligent in the fact that the leak existed. Why? Because as a policy, we want folks to make the space safe. Um, and it's not going to be admissible to shift blame um, in the federal system. In the Florida system, it may be admissible to show that a third party could be responsible or culpable. Um, the other thing to remember is that if the individual who did the subsequent remedial measure is also denying ownership or responsibility, for the area that they modified, I may be able to get that evidence in to prove ownership or control, but not negligence. And that's, that's about the extent of what you need to uh, be concerned with from a 407 perspective. This next slide here is about benevolent gestures. It is a Florida-specific rule. Uh, you, you won't find an analogous rule 
in the Federal Rules of Evidence. Uh, and a benevolent gesture is defined in the Florida Evidentiary Code as an action that conveys a sense of compassion or commiseration emanating from human impulses. Um, it's when I go to do something to help somebody because as a human being I just feel like I should. The fact that I went and did something to help someone is not going to be admissible to show that I was responsible for them being in that situation to begin with, with a caveat. And I've got it right up here on the slide. If, along with the gesture, I admit that it's my fault that the person is in this, uh, this condition to begin with, the admission of fault is going to be severed from the benevolent gesture, and the admission will be allowed. Um, I guess the, the teaching point there is if you run somebody over and then you stop to help them, for God's sakes, don't tell them it's your fault that you run them over. Because if you do, it's going to be admissible under 4026. Let's look at offers to compromise. And this is uh, Florida Rule 90.408. Um, if I'm trying to negotiate a private settlement uh, for which I may or may not have liability, and as part of the negotiation, uh, I offer to compromise a claim um, and, and want to say, hey, look, man, I'll, I'll pay you something. Um, I can't offer that to establish negligence. And that's really what this slide is saying. Uh, it's relatively straightforward, um, and it mirrors um, the, uh, the federal rule of evidence. And you look here at this slide. The federal rule also bars such stuff used to impeach uh, through a prior consistent statement. Um, except that in a federal situation, if I'm in a criminal case, uh, I may be able to get it in. And I can always use it for witness bias, uh, to show why a delay occurred, or to prove obstruction. But those are relatively narrow categories. For the most part, offers to compromise, attempts to negotiate, private civil um, disputes are not going to be admissible at trial in either jurisdiction. Now, payment of medical or similar expenses um, if I furnish or offer or promise to pay medical or hospital expenses or other damages caused by an injury or accident, that's not going to be admissible to prove liability. Uh, why? Because as a policy perspective, we want them to do that. We want folks to assist in that fashion, and we're going to reward them. Um, We also have uh, underneath uh, this particular section of the code in the state of Florida, the collateral source rule. Um, in other words, if I'm in a car accident and my insurance company pays for your uh, treatment or your uh, suffering, whatever it happens to be, you can't offer the evidence of the insurance company having paid the bill as proof of liability. Uh, and, and the goal is to not mislead the jury. Um, we don't want the jury thinking that a plaintiff has been sufficiently comp uh, compensated already such that they can't uh, properly get uh, recovery. And we're concerned with the shifting of responsibility uh, or the negative or improper impact that it would have on the adjudication of the court, particularly in the liability phase. And I've got, given you the case right up here. Uh, and that's Gromley v. GTE from a 1991 Florida case. Now, the federal rules of evidence bar the use of impeachment through prior inconsistent statement or contradiction when we're dealing with offers to compromise, um, except for the exception in criminal cases. And I've got that up here on the slide for you. Um, and then finally, I want to remind you again that in the federal system, I can also use it to show bias, delay, and an attempt to um, obstruct justice. Let's look at 409, the actual payment of medical and similar expenses. Uh, the federal rule works like this. If I am paying your medical expenses, um, I can't offer evidence to prove that uh, you intend that I'm liable for the expense that I'm paying for. Uh, we don't admit it. 
We have the same collateral source rule for the evidence uh, in medical expenses that we have for offers to compromise. Uh, works pretty much the same. Uh, in the federal system, you can sever out uh, an offer to pay medical expenses from a negotiation to compromise based upon the timeline of whether or not uh, there was a, an issue in controversy. Uh, there was an anticipated litigation, but you don't have an analogous uh, set of circumstances in the state of Florida. Let's look at uh, 90.410, uh, which is the inadmissibility of pleas, plea discussions, and related statements. Uh, in Florida, uh, I cannot offer the fact that the defendant tried to negotiate uh, a lesser plea, uh, agreed to plead nolo contendere, or agreed to plead guilty to a lesser offense to prove that they're guilty. And I can't do that in any civil or criminal proceeding um, in, in the state of Florida those plea negotiations are sacrosanct. Uh, they are there to push the process forward. And if a defendant or a civil litigant was ever concerned with a possible admission of liability through plea negotiation, uh, they just wouldn't negotiate. And since pleas are the grease that actually make the wheels of justice turn, because without them we could never deal with the amount of uh, work that is available in the court system, uh, we're going to, as a matter of policy, not allow them to be admitted at trial. Um, the Florida rule differs in several aspects from the federal rule in this regard. The federal rule only applies to the defendant, um, and the federal rule will let in some statements that the Florida rule doesn't. The Florida rule is much broader and much more protective of the negotiation process than the federal rules is, and that, in fact, is a is a theme that you see uh, when comparing the Florida Evidence Code to the Federal Rules of Evidence. There is more of a concern with the process and more concern with the rights of the individual uh, within the state evidentiary code than is found at the federal level. Um, 90.4025 is a Florida specific rule. It is different um, and unique. What it does is it allows for evidence of paternity in criminal prosecutions where a person under the age of 18 years gives birth to a child and the defendant is being prosecuted for sexual misconduct, battery, unlawful sexual activity with a minor, or lewd and lascivious offense against uh, someone less than 16 years of age. In other words, we're going to let in a paternity test that proves that you're the guy who impregnated someone who was a minor when you're charged with that type of offense. There is no federal counterpart. Uh, to this particular rule in the state of Florida. Now, Florida has a separate statute, section 794.022, that deals with victims of sexual battery. And the first thing that Florida says is that if you have a victim of sexual battery, you do not need to corroborate that testimony to achieve a conviction. Uh, it also allows for um, the exclusion of specific instances of prior consensual sexual activity between the victim and any person other than the offender. Uh, so if I am trying to prove that you sexually abuse someone under uh, 794.022, I cannot use the fact that you previously engaged in consensual sex to do so within the state. As you think of 794.022, I want you to remember Federal Rule of Evidence 412 and the Rape Shield Rule, because there are some similarities between the two. Uh, the Florida Sexual Battery Statute is broader in some aspects because it looks at all parts and portions of um, sexual misconduct, not just rape. But you'll notice here uh, in this slide, we also allow for evidence of prior sexual conduct of the victim when we're looking at source of semen, pregnancy, injury, or disease, <coughs> or when consent is at issue, and it would establish a pattern of conduct previously that would indicate a mistake of fact defense and believing that uh, consent occurred at this particular time. Uh, very similar to 412, but a completely separate statute in the state of Florida. 
Of course, here we allow for evidence concerning consent. When consent is a defense, uh, if the victim is mentally incapacitated or this defect, it could be admissible to prove a lack of voluntariness on the part of the victim. And as well, um, the fact that the victim asks for the defendant to use a, a prophylactic device, protection, is not going to be admissible to show that the offense was committed or that consent was actually given. And if you'll think about it for a moment, uh, this makes sense from a public health perspective. Uh, God forbid that uh, anyone's ever in that situation, but if you are the victim of a sexual encounter and you are being sexually assaulted and you can't stop it, uh, the use of a prophylactic would at least arguably protect you from disease. And so we should not punish folks who ask for the use of a prophylactic because uh, we think that it's an indication of consent. And the rule uh, understands that. Um, I want to note here that Florida has no rule that is comparable uh, to Federal Rule of Evidence uh, 413. Um, uh, the 413 and 414 statutes for sexual assault uh, are propensity rules in the, in the federal system. They're problematic because they allow for character evidence uh, to show that the defendant acted in conformity therewith. Uh, Florida doesn't treat this evidence that way. We treat it uh, in much the same way that we would treat any other non-character theory of relevancy under 4042. And in fact, 4042A specifically allows for uh, the use of prior sexual conduct uh, to show these things. And you would look at motive, opportunity, intent, or preparation, just like you would with, with any other character flaw uh, or trait. That's different from the federal rules, uh, but that's not uncommon. Many states have not adopted an analogous uh, rule to 413 and 414, primarily because the rules as they are currently drafted in the Federal Rule of Evidence, while not having been challenged constitutionally uh, at the Supreme Court level, uh, are problematic uh, and have generally been saved through the application of a 403 balancing test that is in and of itself actually an application of 404B in the federal system. We get away from all that in the state of Florida uh, by not using the rule uh, and instead having 90 404 2A and then 2B, which I've got right up here on the slide for you. Uh, child molestation cases, we do let this propensity evidence in, but we've got several different uh, triggers. They're listed for you here. I suggest that you take a look at them and think about them. Uh, the victim's got to be 16 years of age or younger. Um, it's got to be 10 days before trial. Uh, no notice is required, though, if I'm going to use this stuff for impeachment. Um, the takeaway from this is that Florida separates out abuse of children and the use of propensity evidence with abuse of children from the abuse of adults sexually and the use of propensity evidence when we have adults involved. I think it's a, 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 um, a recognition that it is more difficult uh, in those circumstances where the adult could potentially have consented to the behavior. Uh, with a child, it's not an issue because a child, uh, by their very nature, cannot consent to sexual activity uh, before they've reached an age where the law allows them to do so. So it's, it's per se um, uh, a, um, a difference. Now, before this prior conduct can be admitted for propensity in the state of Florida, uh, the court has got to find by clear and convincing evidence that the defendant committed the prior bad act. Now, that's not a beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's much more than just a, a more likely than not. Um, in the federal system, you can get this type of character propensity evidence in with nothing more than um, preponderance of the evidence. So this is yet another example of Florida more carefully protecting the rights of the individual and being concerned with the potential uh, improper use, uh, the unfairly prejudicial nature of this type of evidence, and it is more protective in the state of Florida than it is in the federal system. Well, that's taken us through uh, Florida character evidence. We've looked at the 400 series. We've addressed uh, habit, uh, compromise, uh, medical expenses, offers to plead. We've looked at the sexual assault crimes. Uh, in our next section, 
we're going to move on and we're going to discuss uh, privilege and the ways in which privilege work uh, both in the federal system and within the uh, state of Florida. Till next time, I'm Charlie Rose.